Welcome to the Chapter 6 podcast, A Tour of the Cell. This may be Chapter 7 in your book if you've got one of the later editions, uh, but this is ultimately going to just go through and give us a quick overview of the structures of a cell, uh, the organelles, some of the basic characteristics. This chapter will not go into the details, uh, so don't expect us to go into exactly how many of these organelles work. This is more just going to be that they do work and what their general job is. So moving on. Starting kind of with a small end of things, we get to prokaryotic cells. Uh, I'll highlight that these cells are small, certainly. Uh, they tend to be somewhere in the ballpark. You can think of it as about one-tenth the size of a eukaryotic cell. Uh, they obviously lack the nucleus. Pro means before. Whenever you see karyo, that's referring to a nucleus. Uh, so what we'll commonly refer to them as just having naked organelles, or at least I will. Uh, and by this, we mean that they don't have any membrane-bound organelles. So you're not going to find a nucleus or a mitochondria or any of the organelles that are surrounded by a single or a double membrane. Just not going to happen. They do, however, still have structures. A lot of people like to think that prokaryotes are like bereft of stuff, but they do have structures. Uh, they will have a plasma membrane. All cells will have a plasma membrane. That'll basically surround the cell, so that way we have kind of a clear inside the cell, uh, and that way we'll have a clear outside the cell. This is necessary to make sure you can maintain homeostasis, maintain your metabolism. Inside the cell, they'll have cytosol slash cytoplasm. And really, that's just a, a slightly different words that mean very similar things. The cytosol is going to be this fluid, gel-like substance that's inside the cell. Uh, so it's kind of like the cream filling of the cell, if you will. The cytoplasm includes this gel-like fluid as well as any organelles. So cytoplasm is going to be just a little bit broader term when we use it uh, that describes the insides of the cell. So we've got plasma membranes the outside, the cytosol cytoplasm, that's the inside. And then you'll have ribosomes in prokaryotes, and these will just be small guys that we'll talk about later, but they're always associated with making proteins. Uh, and you're going to need proteins, even if you're a prokaryote. So you will have these ribosomes. They do not have a membrane around them. They're just little chunks of protein and rRNA uh, that are used to make more proteins. One other thing I want to hit before we leave prokaryotic cells is to think that prokaryotic cells are simplistic in terms of they don't have a lot of stuff inside of them, but that doesn't mean that they can't do interesting, in some cases, complicated things. They just can't do a whole lot of those things. Uh, when you look at the most diverse organisms, organisms that can do things that no one else can, those will be prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells have been around for about 4 billion years. They have been undergoing mutation, developing different abilities that eukaryotes in their 2 to 2.5 billion years can only dream of. The main issue is prokaryotes are very, very much like a one-trick pony. You'll have an individual prokaryotic cell may be able to do something cool, but it can't do a bunch of cool things. Uh, it's, it's typically going to be very honed in on a specific habitat, a specific type of metabolism, whereas eukaryotes, which are much larger, uh, they have, they're much more compartmentalized, so they have much more ability to do a variety of tasks. So even though their tasks tend to be much more mundane, uh, much more kind of ordinary, they can do more stuff, so we tend to think of them as being more complex. But just realize that prokaryotes, if you want to come down to molecular complexity, the diversity of molecules they have that they can break down, that they can build, prokaryotes win every time. It's just individual prokaryotes are only able to do limited things, but as a whole, they can do lots of stuff. Moving on here, this will just be the picture. You can see that you can also have a cell wall for prokaryotes. Uh, that's fairly normal. You can have a capsule. This is just a protective surrounding layer. This is useful because many prokaryotes will ultimately try to parasitize something or live in or on something that could be in a dangerous place or in harsh conditions. So they have ways to kind of protect themselves. Uh, they can have flagella. They can have these extensions which can allow them to move. So they can be mobile, especially in fluid. They'll have these pili, and these are cool because they can use this to stick to stuff, just like the capsule. Uh, this allows them to stick like to our bodies uh, so they can stay put even if we try to kind of wash them off. Uh, they have this ability to, to stay put. That's why you typically use hand sanitizer or soap to try and make sure you kill them because otherwise they'll just hang on. And then they've got these pili. And these pili, beyond just sticking to things, they can also form these channels between two bacteria where they can exchange genetic information, these little circular pieces of DNA called plasmids. 
And so this allows them, even though they can't sexually reproduce, to do some pretty cool stuff where they can kind of move genes, what we call more a horizontal. Uh, it's not to your children, it's to somebody else. Uh, so they can move these genes, and so that means that a bacteria could end up getting something like antibiotic resistance from another bacteria, and there's no mating or anything else involved. So this will be, to some extent, their equivalent of sex. It's not exactly sex, but it serves a similar purpose. And then you'll see the nucleoid, where even though prokaryotes are kind of like the one-room schoolhouse, where they don't have these compartments inside, they still organize stuff. Just like you might have one big room, but you've got a couch and a TV on one side, and you've got a desk on the other side, and a kitchen table here with some stuff, you can still have organization. And so they will keep their one long circular piece of DNA or chromosome. Uh, they'll keep that kind of compacted, usually towards the middle, and we call that the nucleoid. And that's where they'll keep that. And then surrounding it, you'll see that they'll have some ribosomes that'll be making proteins, some of the plasmids, etc. So there will be lots of enzymes and lots of stuff that's in this cytosol that's hanging around there. But they do have, even within the prokaryote, there is some organization. Now cytoskeleton, I'm, I'm going to kind of jump because this is something too that you can see to some extent in uh, prokaryotes. And you do see this in eukaryotes as well. Uh, but this will be just like the framework inside of a cell where you're going to have these long protein fibers that normally kind of join up end to end or form rings that just kind of go along end to end. Uh, and so they're going to form a skeleton inside of the cell, so cytoskeleton. Uh, this is very, very useful because this is what allows a cell to have support, which is what allows it to have stuff like shape. It can oftentimes let it move, especially like amoebas that have this ability to use what's called pseudopodia, where they kind of like chunk out part of their cytoplasm. Uh, by using their cytoskeleton and extending it, and then they can kind of ooze and drag themselves along. I uh, don't know if it's the most attractive thing as far as we go, uh, but it's effective, and they use it, and it's partly due to this idea of the cytoskeleton that lets them shift around the cell. Uh, and then it'll be used for a whole bunch of stuff inside the cell to control things. We can anchor stuff to it. Uh, you'll have vacuoles and such be tugged along these so they can get from one part to another. So it really helps us organize and control what's going on. So it allows us to have this biochemical regulation where you can determine where things are at, who's with them, to try and control how the cell is functioning. So we don't spend forever on the cytoskeleton, but it is a pretty critical basic thing for most cells, it does a lot of things that you just kind of take for granted that this cell is rod shaped or this cell is a spirochete that's like you know helical. Uh, we kind of just take those things for granted, but in the background you have the cytoskeleton allowing all of those things to happen. Uh, you don't normally see it easily when you look at a cell, but it's there. Uh, if you looked at a cell, it'd be kind of like a ropes course, one of those things where the ropes kind of going all over the room and you're trying to like weave your way through them. That's a lot more like what you'd see inside of the cell if we could actually visualize this cytoskeleton easily. Okay, centrosomes and centrioles. Uh, these guys are parts that make some of these cytoskeletal elements, but for specific purposes of cell reproduction. So these guys are going to be produced from a centrosome, which all things have. It's just a region that makes these microtubules that'll be used to make the, the spindle during eukaryotic cell division. Uh, but you'll also see that animal cells will have these centrioles, which are these little round double guys uh, that you'll see, and that identifies them as animals. So you only find these in animals. So this helps us separate out plant cells, plant eukaryotic cells, from animal eukaryotic cells, the presence of this. But everybody, essentially, all eukaryotes will have centrosomes. But these are going to be specifically to move the chromosomes. That's their job. So they're not like your normal cytoskeleton that's in like everyday function. These are ones that are used for moving genetic material in preparation for splitting the cell. And then we've got these guys which prokaryotes do have or can have cilium flagella. And they're similar structure. It's more just a size difference where cilia you tend to have more of them and they're smaller. So if you kind of draw that cell out, you'll see there's a whole bunch of them and they look like hairs or I like to kind of think of them sometimes as like ores because that's how they work. They tend to beat in one direction, and then that moves whatever fluid you're in along it. So if you're a cell, you can actually beat these together and move, so you can actually propel yourself. Or you also have, where like in people, you'll have these in your throat. And so when you get mucus that builds up in your lungs and your chest, these guys can essentially just beat upwards. And because they're fixed, they can't move, 
but the actual fluid, the mucus, can. And so they can kind of haul it up into the back of your throat and dump it in. And smokers tend to mess with these, which is why you'll see smokers oftentimes hacking up mucus because their body and their lungs can't get rid of it normally. And so they're trying to just, you know, cough it out. And then flagella is usually, although some prokaryotes go a bit crazy with this, uh, it's usually present in smaller numbers and it's much bigger. It's essentially going to go back and forth or it's going to spin kind of like a motor where it kind of twists around. Uh, but it's going to allow it to be propelled or once again it can move other stuff like in sponges it'll move water through the sponge and grab food. Uh, but you'll oftentimes see one or two, you can get kind of weird combinations sometimes like one on the front and some prokaryotes do go nuts and have quite a few. But in general things will have a, a smaller number of flagella. Obviously in eukaryotes we do have flagella present on human sperm. That's where most people would have seen this uh, or at least known of it. But lots of things that are aquatic and single-celled will use this because it's an easy way to move around if you're aquatic. It's obviously not the best way to move around if you're non-aquatic terrestrial because there wouldn't be fluid to use, so you would just have a weird thing sticking out that's useless. Okay, cell surfaces. So you do have cell walls that can be in prokaryotes as we kind of wrap up their stuff. And specifically in bacteria, the ones that are the most common prokaryote, there's also Archaeans or archaebacteria, uh, those guys are, are a bit more archaic seeming, they're extremophiles. They don't have peptidoglycan, but, but they're fairly rare when it's comparing them to regular bacteria. So we're going to use this one, and the molecule they use is peptidoglycan. And this is important because animal cells don't have cell walls. Plants use cellulose, and fungi use chitin. So now this is not the, it's the same stuff that you see in insect exoskeletons, but insect exoskeletons are not cell walls. Uh, but because everybody uses a different chemical, we can actually attack this peptidoglycan with antibiotics, which allows us to kill bacteria and not kill our own cells, not kill eukaryotic cells. So it's one of the cool things that we can actually target if they have that, which most bacteria will. Uh, plants use cellulose for their cells and they do this to surround their cell membrane because in plants they typically have it set up where water wants to come in so because all this water is coming in it starts to push against the cell membrane and if you didn't have a cell wall there it would eventually push it enough that you actually ruptured like you had your inside start to shoot outside and so by having this rigid cell wall it prevents the cell membrane from spreading too far so it does become turgid it does get pressurized but ultimately it's not going to rupture so for plants, the cell wall is a very important piece for them, whereas animal cells, we just tend to keep ourselves pretty much even with the water around us uh, so that the water doesn't want to come into our cells. We're just kind of chilling and everybody's happy and water goes back and forth, but overall we're not going to get ruptured. Uh, but we will talk in later chapters about how sometimes that can happen in specific scenarios with animals. And then lastly, I want to bring up plasmodesmata, which is how uh, this is found in plant cells, but it's basically how plant cells oftentimes don't kind of exist on their own. We like to think of cells as being individual entities, but in reality, many cells have these, these junctions between them, especially on multicellular organisms like plants and animals. And so plasma desmata will be our poster child here. And the way this works is it's a channel, cytoplasmic channel, where you can essentially take cytoplasm from one guy and move it right to the other because the cell membrane kind of just does a little U here on both sides, which allows the two cells to be connected by this thin channel. And there can be many different plasmodesmata attached to different plant cells, but it allows materials to go straight from one cell to another without ever having to go through a cell membrane or through a cell wall. It's not always used, but there's a lot of stuff in plants that uses these plasmodesmata. So it's one way to get things around between cells. So it's also another feature that you might see if you look at these cell surfaces where you've got a plasma membrane, uh, you've got a cell wall in many cases, uh, and in some cases like prokaryotes, you can even have a capsule, another protective layer outside of that. All right, cell size. You guys should by now know that you are not composed of one single big cell. That, that If you are, then something is horribly wrong and you're probably going to die soon. But if you are a normal person, your body is going to be composed of probably around 100 trillion cells. Now the reason for this is because when cells get too big, they start to have problems. And those problems will become lethal 
if they keep going on too far. And this all just comes down to two things, surface area and volume. Think of surface area as being the, the part of a cell, the plasma membrane specifically, so we can just say this is the plasma membrane, and it's going to be the part that's the giver is what I will say. So this is the part where we can essentially bring in materials that the cell needs, we can get rid of the materials that the cell needs to get rid of. So this is kind of taking care of the cell's needs. The volume is like the greedy part, it's the taker part. That's the part that's actually using all these materials and generating all of this waste. And so if you have a very, very small cell, just a little bit guy here, you have a lot of surface area and not much volume. So very small cells are going to be high surface area and they're going to be low volume. If it helps, you can think of a pizza when it's really small, you have a lot of crust and you have very little cheese stuff in the middle. As we start to increase this, as we get bigger and bigger, what happens is inside the cell, we're growing at a faster rate. So the volume itself is going up faster than the surface area. So the surface area does go up, but it goes up just a little bit. And the volume goes up a lot. And so as this goes on, our actual ratio, surface area to volume, goes down. It plummets. And so the bigger and bigger you get, you start to have way more volume relative to your surface area. So that means that you're, you need all this stuff. You need all this food. You need to get rid of all this waste. But the surface area is not growing at the same rate, so it can't get in enough stuff. It can't get rid of all the waste. And so the cell ends up having issues where it kind of starves to death or ends up more or less choking on its own waste. And so the solution for most cells to this is just to divide. And if they divide, you can see you can kind of put this cell membrane or cell wall, depending on exactly which type of thing it is, uh, but you're going to put a, a, some type of membrane dividing this down the middle. And so you now have where each side is essentially half the normal volume, because we've cut it in half. But you'll see that this, the kind of the, the outer wall and the new inner one we built, are still ultimately the same as it was before. So before I had this piece and this piece, so you can see they're the same length as uh, this is, if you're not seeing this. So basically the outer particular membrane pieces are going to be the same size regardless of if it's the new one or the original one. All you do is you cut in half the, like the top and the bottom. Because if I split it in half, the top and the bottom do end up getting smaller in surface area. The upshot of all this is that this cell that just got split in half does not have a surface area that's half the regular size the surface area is more than half the regular size because I built that new wall down the center, that new membrane down the center. And so my surface area, and I'm just going to kind of make up a number here, uh, but it's gonna, we'll say it's going to go down and it's going to now be somewhere maybe like 70% of what it was. But the volume went down to be 50% of what it was. So our volume at this point is dropping faster than our surface area. So we can kind of reverse this process just by splitting the cell to make it smaller. By splitting the cell to make it smaller, we increase our surface area to volume ratio so the cell stabilizes. So if a cell is getting too big, it can just divide in two, and that stabilizes it. It increases the surface area to volume ratio. It ensures it can get what it needs, get rid of what it needs to, while still maintaining all the chemical reactions it needs to, the metabolism, uh, in the volume part of the cell, the cytosol or the cytoplasm. Uh, let me get rid of that. So we can just do cytoplasm. Uh, it can maintain all the reactions it needs to so it can stay alive. So this is why we don't get gigantic cells. And the only time we ever might get really big cells is you can see some really big cells, like certain nerve cells, but they're just going to be really long and really skinny. And so that way they still have a relatively low volume and a relatively high surface area because they're so skinny. So there are some nerve things like in giant squids, uh, in giraffes, that can be in some cases like five, six feet long but they're five or six feet long and incredibly thin. You're not going to normally just see like the blob where it's one giant cell and it's huge. That type of cell could not meet its needs. Okay, this is going to be a quick picture. I'll try to do a real, real quick overview of, uh, this is an animal cell, but of a eukaryotic cell. So within a eukaryotic cell, we've got these general labeled guys. Uh, you'll see ones that have a squiggly kind of thing inside. This will be our mitochondria. You'll see they're fairly large. Uh, the number of them can vary you'll see that we've got this smooth stuff that's continuous with the nuclear or the nucleus and the nuclear envelope is the outside of that so you'll see it's kind of attached to it so this stuff here that looks kind of like folds 
The ones that have dots on it will be the rough ER, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and the stuff without dots will be the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The stuff here that I like to think of is a stack of pancakes that's kind of separate from the ER but looks somewhat similar. Uh, that will be called the Golgi apparatus or the Golgi body, depends on which book you read. We'll have the nucleus itself here with a little solid looking dot. It'll typically be darker than the rest of the nucleus and that's called the nucleolus. And then there's a bunch of these guys that have a single membrane that are just chilling out here that just look like these little sacks of stuff. And for those ones, I'd honestly have to double check myself. Uh, typically the bigger ones will be vacuoles. When you start to get to smaller ones, usually the smallest ones are probably vesicles is what they're called. They're just basic transport. And then you'll have some other ones that are kind of medium that will be peroxisomes and lysosomes that we'll talk about. But for those ones, I normally wouldn't put a picture of them and expect you to identify it unless I tell you what's inside of them. So we'll get into that later. But that's just kind of an overview. You obviously have the plasma membranes going to be this outermost part. And then you're going to have the cytoplasm or the cytosol if you're ignoring the organelles will be this internal part. This one does not have a flagella or any cilia, so we don't really have to worry about any of those external things that are sticking out from here. And it's not a plant cell, so there's no cell wall. So you guys should be capable of identifying these features, which we will go into more depth with, but you should be capable of identifying them if you see a picture. These last guys here, you'll see the centrioles that we already talked about. And you'll see there's two of them, and that indicates that this is definitely an animal cell. At this point, I'm going to kind of stop and I'll break it up into our first of the videos so I can make sure they stay short for you guys. I'll pick up specifically with things that are only found in eukaryotes that are not really found at all within prokaryotes. Uh, so we'll pick up with that when we get to the next podcast. I hope you enjoyed.